Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. I am here today with Alex Pachari. Did I pronounce your name right? Right? Yes. Okay. You did a great job. Okay, thank you. I'm starting off to a good, I'm on a good the yeah. good foot or whatever. Uh, anyway, there's a few things I could tell you about Alex. Um, I don't know him real well. We had a, a, some preliminary conversations. Number one, he's got a great personality. Number two, he's the kind of guy you could tell just likes, surrounded by, likes to be surrounded by good friends. He's enthusiastic, great smile, and he loves to eat to the point where I never, I'm like the most boring you know, stoic eater. I'm like a real boring, healthy eater. Like, you know, give me like a fresh salad. I'm happy. But when I looked at some of your Facebook pictures, this guy's eating French crawlers or stuff with powdered sugar. And he's having so much fun. I like, I wanted one. I was like, you know what? And, and fuck it. I don't really care about my diet today. And I just want to eat two of whatever he's having. Cause your yeah. enthusiasm for food is like <laughs> infectious, man. You can just tell. Yeah, so, living in new Orleans does that to you. So yeah, man. And he has the most perfect teeth of anybody I've ever interviewed. So there you go. <laughs> new setting new highs here on everyone loves guitar. Anyway, let me tell you a little bit about Alex. He's born and raised in Little Rock, Arkansas. His dad was an Iranian immigrant. His mom is from rural Arkansas. He started playing guitar at age 12, took lessons because his mom got really angry at him and his dad for going over budget when they bought their first, when, they, when his dad bought Alex's first guitar. It turned out great because he was introduced to an amazing teacher who put him on the right path musically. He then went to Loyola University in New Orleans for jazz studies. And I'm always wary of you jazz guys. Because like intellectually, me too. I'm wary. I'm wary of jazz guys too. I, I, I took, <laughs> don't don't get don't get uh, don't get freaked out by that because I'm not. I wouldn't be a you know. Some people call me a jazz guy, but no. But intellectually, you like have to be super intelligent just to even get through that. Let alone to have like studied it and get a degree in it. So I'm always like, you know. Oh, so see that's the, see that's the ruse though because because so <laughs> many jazz guys you think they're intellectual but really it's just a bunch of bullshit. So you know that's why like the true jazz guys are so hip because they really are. But everybody's all the kids, you know, I would say a good like seventy five percent of all the kids in jazz studies programs around the world are you know like just you know full of shit myself included so it's you know it's the the, the good 25 percent that get out of it those are the ones you really need to listen to the rest of us we're just trying to you know we're just we're just i was just trying to learn my instrument better so that's sort of the only way at reason i took it i always feel i need to like up my intellect like i have to bust out my sat words when i'm speaking oh, to jazz yeah. cats because there's so much okay, so I, 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 I was a southern kid i took my act so i mean i I was like, you know what? I don't even have to take the SAT, you know, for <laughs> Southern school. I, I, I'm just not going to take it. I, I didn't really do well in my PSAT either. So I was like, ah, fuck it, whatever. Not, not, not for me. <laughs> All right, man. You've, you've, you've uh, neutralized my worry, my worry quotient good, for the good. Okay, good. That's, I don't want you to feel, you know, let's, let's talk about everything, you know? All right. So he gets up to Loyola and his first day, welcome Hurricane Katrina hits New Orleans. Transfers to St. Louis University, and there was a silver line in there in that he got hooked up with Corey Christensen as his private teacher and really expanded his knowledge of guitar and jazz. And I actually checked Corey out. Man, what a player. Real, oh, man. Entertaining. Very he's entertaining. And he, he's The guy taught me so much. Like He taught me about guitar and jazz, but he also taught me a lot about just being – like. Do, you being like you as a musician don't have to be poor and you know you dread bills and do I mean he is the most one of the most entrepreneurial uh players and musicians that I've ever come across because this guy knew how to take his talents I mean he was the one of this he was a senior editor at Mel Bay Publishing for a long time that's what he was doing when I was there uh, and then he, uh, is originally from Utah and he went back, started a guitar program at, uh, at Utah state has worked there for a long time, has a huge, like every time I talk to him, there's always something new going on. I haven't spoken to the guy in a couple of years, uh, unfortunately, cause I, I love him so much, but you know, he's one of those guys, he's always, he's always got something going on and it's always legit whether it's like he's got a huge um 
he's one of those guys who really teaches a lot. So he's got a huge swath of students all across the world who seek him out. And they got, he's got guys calling him every day trying to seek him out. And he's done really well for himself. And, I mean, he's got like five – I think he's got five – I knew him when he had three kids. And now I think he's got five kids. And, uh, oh, wow. and, and they're all getting older, which is super weird. But, yeah, um, he's one of those – he taught me a lot, not only musically, but just – how to be, you know, how to live well and how to do it well and how to not, you know, you, do, you don't have to accept being, you know, poor as a musician or, or just like, you know, only living like a lower middle class or even a middle class lifestyle. I mean, he's done really well for himself and he's done it with dignity and he hasn't, you know, he hasn't quote unquote sold out or, you know, which I don't think he necessarily can do. Um, <clears throat> but he's, um, he's just one of the, he's, he, he's really inspirational in that, in that sense. But yeah, he, he kind of, that was the silver lining of that, that moment. So he saw, he taught you the success mindset, which is so important to learn for everybody yeah. in any business. You know, I was like, I'm lucky to have every teacher I've had that's, that's affected me. Both of my parents, my wife, like every person that I've been lucky to surround myself with, um, has had that mindset it has, kind of imparted that mindset on me too, whether it's like close friends or, or mentors or parents, you know, or family members, you know, both of my parents were great at their jobs. They were the best at their jobs. You know, my aunt, you know, people in my family, my grandfather, you know, they weren't big jobs, but they were the best at them. Hmm. And that's sort of one of the things. And, and my teach, all my teachers have been the best at what they do because they've just, you know, they've been able to just do make a good living doing it. And, um, so that I mean, I've just been really lucky to surround, have myself surrounded by those kinds of people. So awesome, man! Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um. So, uh, he he goes back to New Orleans the following January, finishes his degree, and he was in a band out of college for three years. Um, toured all over the Midwest and South. All do it yourself stuff. I'm assuming, right? That's what, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. Oh yeah. Band broke up, and he moved to Nashville in 2012 to pursue playing professionally. And aside from playing professionally, this is really interesting. We'll talk about this. He's worked in a lot of different business facets of the music industry. Like he worked in management for uh, Terrence Blanchard and Robert Glasper for two years. He was a jazz booking agent for two years, and he still tour manages a few different artists. And some fun facts about Alex. Number one, he met Lenny Kravitz on the same day, four years apart. Um, We'll talk about that, but I don't. What I find is weird is how the hell did you know it was the same? Was it like a, a uh, like a, a birthday or something? Like how would no, you? It, it, yeah, I mean, I, so it, it's that's a, a little story. weird. <laughs> I can just tell it. It's pretty funny. Like, so I went. I did a semester abroad in the Netherlands. Um, did you go to Oss? And, uh, no, I was in. Uh, I was in. Uh, the, I was in Nijmegen. But before I went to Nijmegen, uh, I was. I went to. Uh, I was in Amsterdam. Uh, and this was during the Olympics in 2000 and, uh, not 2008. And, uh, and I was in a coffee shop and I was writing in my journal. Wait a minute. When you up, say coffee shop, oh, coffee no, shop, do you mean a hash bar? <laughs> Come yeah. on, let's keep but it, it, was, it was, keep it I mean, real I mean, here. <laughs> coffee in these places too, but I was, I was, <laughs> no one's high. going there for the coffee. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when you're high, coffee's great. You know? So, so uh, is we, any, we, wait a minute. Anything we, is great. We preface, this, we preface this whole thing with me pouring, uh, you know, uh, a <laughs> pour over in front of, in front, in front of you. So, but but no, so I'm sitting there. I'm writing in my journal. All of a sudden, I see Lenny Kravitz walk in with his with his you know Russian model girlfriend. She's very 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 smart, very cute. So we come in. They come in and they sit down like really close to me. And we, I see this paparazzi guy like take a picture from the window. And and Lenny's like, ah, oh, what do you? Come on, man. I'm just trying to hang out. So I just kind of started talking to him. I was like, that must suck, you know, whatever. And we started talking. Brought up the New Orleans connection. And we we chatted there and I really just spoke to his girlfriend for, I don't know, an hour, maybe it seemed like a little bit more, maybe. And so that was pretty much it. Uh, Four years later, I I have a friend visiting from uh, D.C. and we go we were in New Orleans and we go see uh, Rebirth Brass Band on Tuesday night. And if you if you if you've ever been to New Orleans or if you live there, you know, Tuesday nights are a huge night uh, to see them. And we're at the Maple Leaf bar and we're sitting at the bar i look around and i see cuba gooding jr and i said oh look it's cuba gooding jr 
So I'm, I'm kind of talking to my friend, you know, you see, you see actors and actresses there a lot because they're there to promote their movie or they're there to film, um, film industry's big there. And I look next to him and Lenny Kravitz is standing right next to him. And it's August around the same time it was then. And I, I was like, wait a second, this is really weird. I, this has to be like super close to the day where I saw him when I lived in the Netherlands. Um, so I go back through my phone I look at the picture. Oh my God, are you OCD? Literally within like, I, it was literally like four years. And I was just like, holy wow. shit, wow. this is, I have to say something to him. This is like unbelievable. I had never spoken to Lenny Kravitz since then. I mean, we were both probably high off our balls. And he, of course, is not going to remember me. So, you know, I had some liquid courage. So I walked up to him. I was like, hey, man. I'm really sorry to bother you, but I have to because four years ago you were in Amsterdam and I was in Amsterdam and uh, and we met each other and we spoke for a long time and I wanted to just say hello and whatever. And I had a the, we took a picture together when I was in the Netherlands. And so I showed it to him. Oh, my like, God. This, this is us, you know. And he looked at me with this sort of like glazed over like, yo, dude, I'm fucked up and trying to listen. To you. <laughs> and he sees the picture. He looks at me and he gives me this like, holy shit. And he goes, whoa, dude, that's crazy. And then that was pretty much it. <laughs> uh, are you are you OCD? Are you a little OCD? Am I OCD? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say OCD. No, I mean, I'm, I, I'm very organized, but I wouldn't, you know, it's not like a, it's not like a condition by any means, but, uh, you know, cause I've lived in, I mean, I lived in the dregs before and it's not really bothered me, but, uh, yeah, I, but I went back cause I put, I mean, you know, it was one of those things like, I just remember I post, I posted it on Facebook. Okay. I would, so, I, at, I asked you cause I would never, <laughs> ever have looked in my, in my, in my like calendar to go back there. I, I was like, wow, that was pretty deep, very yeah, detailed. Well, it, yeah, that was a little OCD, Alex. It was just a little post, bit. Well, I posted it. I posted it that day when I when, when, okay. when I did it. Okay. Oh, so, okay. So you went back to your Facebook and looked at like, yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was easy so access. It, it was, it was, even if it wasn't like to the day, it was around that yeah, time. It was okay. just hilarious. I was just like, you know, and so in, in the four years later, I was living in Nashville and I was like, Okay. Where the fuck is Lenny Crab? You know? <laughs> of course, but I didn't see him. So you know, it's just fucking. That's just one of those funny. Imagine you run into him like in a law office, Lenny. You know, this is the first time I've seen you sober. <laughs> right, right, right. right. So, first so, time we saw it. it, yeah. it be, if I, I, pro I probably wouldn't be sober though either. So he wouldn't see me sober. Oh, that is a good story. He okay. His second cool story is he let Doctor John borrow his three thirty five, and it then got him an audition for his band. Since you're on a roll, man, go roll with it. Let's yeah. Go. So uh, I was playing. So this was like right after I had. Uh, I was like in transition from New Orleans to Nashville, and I was with an artist, and we opened for Doctor John in New Orleans. Uh, for the, you know they they have so many different like concert series for the, open for the public in New Orleans, and this was. Uh, called Wednesdays in the Square, and we opened for him. And uh, afterwards, I was talking to his trombone player, uh, just you know, chatting it up after the show. And they were about to go on, and she comes up to me and says, "Hey, uh, you know, Max Mac Revenac is his mm. name. They call yeah. him Mac. Max um, Max nephew uh, f forgot his guitar. Uh, would he be able to borrow one of yours?" And I said, "Fuck off! Obviously, yeah, of yeah. course." So I had my 335 there with me, uh, and I had a, a telly with me, and I wasn't going to let him use a telly. Like, you know, he needs a 335. So I let him borrow a 335, and it was, like, uh, very cool. I mean, it was awesome to see, the doc, you know, one of your idols playing your uh, playing your instrument. And I kind of feel like it puts he put some really good, really good juju on it. And uh, and so uh, after that, they got me a relationship with, the, uh, with his trombone player. Um, and uh, once I moved up to Nashville – I read it. I someone sent me an article that said Dr. John's band was all fired except for the trombone player. So <laughs> wow, that's uh, and, really random. Holy crap! Yeah. Uh, so she, so I guess she assumed the role of musical director in his band, and so I hit her up and said, "Hey, look, you know, I'm really sorry to hear about the band. I'm I'm happy to hear that you were, you know, you that you stayed on. You know, if he's ever looking for more guys, and I'd love to throw my hat in the ring at least, you know, just to say I did." And she said, okay, no worries, you know, I'll let you know. And uh, maybe a month and a half later, this was January or February or something, she hits me up and was like, hey, we're, you know, 
uh, hit a couple of emails back and forth, but she said, if you can get to New Orleans uh, this on this day, like, you know, the same week, uh, we'll give you an audition because we're auditioning uh, a keyboard player. So, you know, that sort of, hey, letting him borrow my 335, I went yeah. down there and auditioned for his band. So it was it was pretty cool, man. It was a good experience. I, uh, you know, I, and, and it was one of those things, like, uh, I never, I got to play with him, and, you know, it was one of those, like, random situations of like you got the job but you really didn't get the job but uh but i got to play right place wrong time with dr john you know very just me cool an organ player and um and got to play a bunch of his songs with him that i've been listening to since i was a baby so it was really really cool experience you know it's just when an artist, you know, when someone needs to borrow your guitar, you might want to let him. <laughs> at yeah, least that's a John, great. You want to let him borrow it. He, he's from up there, isn't he? He's from yeah. He's from New Orleans, born yeah. and raised. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's a good story, man. And another bit of trivia is you can see Alex at age thirteen in the Martin Scorsese documentary about the blues, specifically the episode about BB King. How the heck did you get in that? Yeah, we, well, I, you know, my gr- I grew up listening to BB King. He's my all time number one favorite. I mean, I was listening to him musically before I knew, you know, what guitar was, and and before I even thought about playing guitar. And uh, so we would go see him a lot, and um, we went up to his club uh, for he was doing like a weekend stint in Memphis, and uh, being from Little Rock, it's not that far. So we went up there with my family, and we got you know we got some good seats. We like saved up and got some good seats at the front table right by the stage and they told us when they were filming that uh they were filming a documentary um of the show and uh few i mean this was maybe four three four years later maybe not that much maybe a couple years later martin scorsese documentary came out and they had a whole thing about bb king and i was like holy shit this might be the fucking thing that they were filming this whole time and so it's really brief it's really funny though i had a huge afro when i was a kid i mean fucking (laughs) <laughs> Afro. He had to cut it for like four or five years so you, there it's a the scene of him playing at his club and then they 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 sh- they pan it out to the crowd and like you can see i was sitting at the very back table at the very front this kid with this fucking monster <laughs> just sitting there like like this you know just like eyes glazed over watching <laughs> your idol or whatever and it's it's just really funny it's like this silhouette of this big ass fucking afro um you're, you're a good luck charm, man. These are all like pretty good luck it's things. It's funny. I don't know. It's just like you get yourself into these situations and you remember them. You know, it's like I, uh, you know, it's sort of, uh, yeah, I, like I said, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not seeking any of this out. It just happens. Now, what you need to do is like now create a, like a record specifically for Lenny Kravitz. Right, right, right. Knowing that you're going to bump into him. Yeah, yeah, maybe I should. In write August, like a, right? And you say, you know, then you're just like, boom, you know, making opportunities, man. Yeah. Or, or you know, something that Lenny's maybe involved with. Maybe I'll record with. a cover of, uh, what's that? Is the Hall & Oates song, Baby Come Back? Or uh, who did that song? Uh, and then do it, Lenny Come Back or whatever? Maybe yeah, something like that Lenny Come Back. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, hey, before we get started, on your Facebook page, you have a photo of B.B. King and Ringo Starr. Is that a real photo? Yeah, it is. So B.B. King did a uh, record of B.B. King... Uh, Live in London, I think it's called, mm-hmm. and uh, and Ringo Starr played on like three tracks of it. Um, and, Never and, seen that. Yeah, it's a cool record. Um, so he just went over there and recorded some stuff with a bunch of like musicians over there, and yeah, it's a cool record. And, and Ringo is on. Um, Ringo was was on it. Um, I put that picture up after BB King died, you know, mm-hmm. just because he's you know was my idol. So. Yeah. Put that up there because I always thought it was cool. It's like BB and Ringo, you know. To it was like, oh wow, you would never think that BB and Ringo right. would work together, but you know, Ringo's and Ringo's killing man. He's the, definitely the the least, uh, you know. He's given the least love out of all those all those guys, but you know, I I like Ringo. I think he's a great drummer, man. He's definitely got a thing, and and um and uh, you know, he might not he might not be a wordsmith like Lennon, but. He's got he's got he's got a vibe, man. That's what's important. So yeah, and he's had, really you know, when I was a kid growing up, I'm I'm a bit older than you. He had quite a lot of, uh, not a lot, but he had four or five major hits, you know, in the top twenty, you know, yeah. some of the top ten, as a matter of fact. So yeah, yeah, shit's funky, man. All right, man. So um, let's dig in. So I'm originally from New York City, right? I grew up with everybody, every race, creed, color of humanity, 
just in my building alone, let alone in the city. You have 26 years of living there and interacting with literally tens of thousands of people in school, college, whatever. I would imagine, now I've never been there, not knocking Little Rock, but I would imagine Little Rock, Arkansas might not be the same. So my question was, I was wondering, was it difficult for your dad as an Iranian immigrant moving to Arkansas? Like, did he get hassled? And, you know, if he did or or if he didn't, what lessons maybe did he learn from that that he imparted to you? No, I mean, you know, it's funny, man. It, it's it, it cracks me up. And, and it's 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 because that a lot of people from the north, like, haven't don't really know a lot about the south. But like I've experienced personally and seen personally so much more racism in the north than I ever did in the south. And it's like. This, and really? I think part of, part of that has to do with just the um, the culture of of um, politeness in the South. Okay. You know, yeah. There's like everybody in the South, like at least uh, maybe up until now or whatever, was very you know they 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 kind of at least from my perspective. And I was born in the '80s and grew up in the '90s, mm. and you know. Um, I didn't see it as I saw it more as, as an institutional issue, and I saw it more as a uh, as sort of a um, it's sort of just like a what you know something that you don't really talk about in public as much. Um, Interesting. That said, you know, my father did experience a lot of of that in the six in the seventies when he came here in seventy two, and he went to Houston and um, and Galveston. And when Jimmy Carter threw out all the Iranians in the late seventies, he kicked all this, the Iranians out. He, my dad uh, was a bit was protested was protesting a lot for the with the Iranian Students Association, um, and eventually um, he moved to Little Rock to get away from all of it. So Little Rock, interesting as, as he saw it, was his sort of beacon of hope, sort of getting out of getting out of all of everything and wanting to start a fresh new life. And there was a there was a, a sizable and there still is a sizable Iranian population in Little Rock. Okay. Uh, so I grew up culturally, you know, it's a, in Little Rock. I mean, it's way, it's very very diverse uh, for a southern city. I mean, it's not as probably as diverse as Birmingham or maybe Memphis, but it's still pretty diverse. You know, there was, um, you know, there there's uh, they've got real you know good education. My father went there, got, finished his education, um, and excuse me, and he. Um, you know, I never really saw a lot of that. I mean, it wasn't he got hassled more when he was trying to marry my mother in the mid 80s, you know, with uh, with immigration. When they went up to Memphis, uh, they were telling my mom, you know, he doesn't love you. They want he just wants to marry you and then he's going to leave you. That wow. Was, who was telling her this? Like the immigration, immigration office? The federal government was telling this to my mother when she was. Oh, going, my God. Yeah. That's like, like you couldn't like that's a him. that's an episode on a comedy show. That's not even something that's you, yeah, right. That's bad, not even something that you bad. imagine bad. happening. They never really. I mean, <laughs> I you know, of course, there are a lot of closed minded people in, in the South still. And, and, and even with the politeness, you know, they still don't fully understand it. But it, I never experienced any of that growing up. My father never did. I mean, even right. after 9-11, you know, my father was a dark skin, very, very dark skin Iranian guy. And he never got away. I mean, he was very disarming, the most amazing guy, you know, huge smile. I mean, you know, just one of those guys, he's one of those magnetic guys that, yeah. you know, he walks into a room and he smiles, he says hello to everybody. And you could take any, you know, he could, he could, he could turn the KKK. You know what I'm saying? Like sure. he's one of those kinds of personalities that, you know, he was, he's very, he's very stoic, very quiet, but once you break him and he starts smiling at you and talking to you, I mean, he can hold a conversation with anybody, even though his English wasn't that great. So, right. so yeah, I never really experienced it, man. Um, That's great. And, and you know, if he did, you know, he never let me see it. Neither did my mom. I guess they were good at protecting me from that. But, um, but yeah, I never, he never really saw it. I mean, I, like I said, I've seen, I've seen way worse racism in New York city with people calling cab drivers names and like people, you know, just being so blatantly, like outlandish about you know somebody's race and it's just i guess it's sort of a coping mechanism with people being so close together i don't know i'm not grew up in the south so um but yeah man it's 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 interesting it's really funny there's there's there is a um 
stereotype about the South that, that, you know, the people understandably have. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I Interesting. I experienced more of the institutionalized or institutional racism and like the, um, and sort of the, you know, you know, your a 50 yard race, all the white people start from the 50 or a uh, hundred yard dash. People start from the 50 yard mark. The white people start from the 50 yard mark. So I experienced more of that than I ever did, you know, like really bad coming up to you spouting awful names at you that kind of thing interesting yeah i guess we have that in new york um i don't know i think i i, I we never really i mean growing up there i never really saw it, but my yeah. com- every community was so mixed it was like right. yeah and, and it's and like it's, yeah. It's, when you're forced into it when you're when you're just living in a community when you're born into it at least and that's probably how I the reason I didn't really notice it. And I think with the younger generation being as as open minded as they are, you know, when you're born into a situation where everybody's different, then that's just that's just reality. That's yeah, just what it pretty is. Much. There is no someone else coming in and taking what you have or someone changing the culture to fit their lifestyle and needs. It's sort of like, well, it's just a culture. It's just what it is, you know. Right. Right. So um so yeah, I mean that's sort of that's sort of how I, 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 that's how I look at it, I guess. So interesting. I will say this, the, the South is a much more polite place for sure. You know, it was, it was, yeah. it, was it was funny. Even when we moved, uh, to Tampa, um, <coughs> I was in target and I was asking for some instructions. Like, where, how do you go here? And, uh, Someone turned around and said, "Hey, you know, you sound like you're new. Welcome to Tampa." Yeah. And so, me growing up in New York City, I was like, "What the fuck are they trying to get out of me?" I'm trying to think. Okay, what, what do they want? Yeah, like, what, like what? I don't have any money for you. Dude, like, yet. what's the angle here? You know? And it was like that. It just being friendly. I was like, "Oh, okay." Yeah, so it took a, it took a while for that because in New York is a very uh, it's a hostile culture for sure. Yeah, yeah, and even my wife coming from the Midwestern culture of Chicago. I mean, you know, she said that she she told me that she's you know, like the politeness of the South. Uh, it's it's it, the South is so it's awesome. You know, I lo- I grew up here, lived here, but it it's a it's you know it's a it's an oxymoronic you know life force where like you have all of the awful history of Jim Crow and the Confederacy and all that stuff, but you have some of the nicest people you'll ever meet in your entire life that live in the South and that will hold the door open for anyone and everyone and it's just they they just teach you manners from a very very young age Mm. to to you know respect your elders and hold the door open for for everyone and it's just it's weird man but it's also just like you know there are parts of the south that are just super fucking backwards and you just you know it's just like it's like any family it's like you have that one you know, you have that one person in the family who's like incredibly sweet and nice, but just, you know, it's like, you know, racist grandpa or racist grandma, man. It's yeah. just, you, you just deal with it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. Um, so what, what made you get into music management and how did you like that? And like, what kind of work did you actually do? And who's Terrence Blanchard and Robert Glasper? So. Yeah, so that's another cool story too. So at Loyola, there's a really big music industry uh, program and the head of that program is this guy named John Snyder, who worked for uh, uh, CTI label, the CTI label back in the 70s. And um, and he is a you know, he's another one of my like just the be- one of the best mentors I've ever had. Um, I was helping him uh, in I guess it was my sophomore, junior year of college. He tried to bring the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz to New Orleans at Loyola. Oh, wow. And for those of you who don't know what that is. That's just one of the. It's a. It's a. Uh, an associate's degree program for uh, the best player, best young jazz players in the world, and uh, you have a, a mentor uh, teacher, and every month you get um, private lessons and group lessons from a jazz legend. So wow. Uh, so so just to name a few names on the board are like Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter and <clears throat> T. S. Monk, Thelonious Monk's son, Terrence Blanchard was formerly on the board. Um, you know, and, and so they were doing, they, he brought it to Loyola. They were having the auditions and I, uh, walked up to him and I said, Hey, can I help, you know, with these auditions? He said, yes. And I was, uh, I met all of the people at the Monk Institute through that, 
um, and got to meet, you know, I got to meet Herbie Hancock, which was unbelievable, and Wayne Shorter, which I, like, almost shit my pants when I met these guys because um, they're some of my heroes, too. And so I was working for them in their office. Uh, at, I was one of their student workers. I uh, The head of that, the, the, the director uh, of, the, of, the, of the Loyola pr- uh, program uh, left really soon after it started. Terrence Blanchard was the artist in residence at the time. His man, his tour manager, Vincent Bennett, hopped in to the driver's seat there. He saw me work. He liked what I did. And I started working for him for Terrence Management Company. Terrence Blanchard is uh, a huge jazz artist, trumpet player. He does, he does all the music for Spike Lee's movies. Um, wow. He was Art Blakey's band in the 80s. Um, he's a big New Orleans institution uh, up there with Wynton Marsalis and, you know, he's one of those huge names and he's an incredible guy. And, and so I worked for him for, um, a couple of years. And at that time they were also managing Robert Glasper, who, uh, if people don't know who Robert Glasper is, he's another huge name in jazz, younger generation. Um, he was, uh, he's, I mean, he's won a Grammy for best R and B record recently, last few years, uh, for black radio. Great record. Go check it out. Um, and, uh, he, but we were managing him at the time. So I was doing all of their, all of Robert's like day to day stuff for his records or for his, uh, his touring, excuse me. So, um, so I was sort of their advanced guy. And so I did that for a couple of years. Vincent left, uh, the Terrence's company, uh, Burgess management. And I went with, uh, eventually went to work with Vincent. Um, but in between that, I was a jazz booking agent for two years and did a terrible job at it. And, um, and so management has always been interesting for me because it's just sort of, you know, it's easy for me cause it's just sort of, you're, you're helping artists get shit done that they, they don't need to do. Hmm. Um, and especially for touring and stuff. So that was just sort of, I just fell into it that way. I mean, just, you know, being a, a hard worker and just trying to, I, I, I realized at a certain point in my life, I was going to, I wanted to get to the same, I wanted to get to the, this place of <clears throat> surrounding myself with the greats. And the two, I realized there were two paths for me. There was the path of being a player and there was a path of going at it from a different angle and try and get to the same place. And I realized my playing ability wasn't going to get me there as quick as I wanted to. Uh, so I decided to go the route of working for them and trying to learn from them on a, on a different level, on a personal level, on a business level, and hopefully on a musical level, musical level. And, and so I just, kind of put all my eggs in that basket, um, at a col like at the end of college and out of college. And I think it's, it's worked out for me in the long run. Um, because, you know, I, you know, I can go up to Terrence Blanchard today and, you know, say, Hey, what's up, man. And he'll be like, Oh, wow. What's up, dude. I haven't seen you in a while. You know, that's, that is amazing because that guy is so full of knowledge and, um, and same with same with all the other artists that I've I've worked with, you know, in that capacity. You know, it's I, I've learned wisdom from them that would that would take me so much longer to learn if I had just focused on playing solely. You know, I I, I just made that decision early on, you know, to to, to work within the industry, uh, knowing that my final goal was to be a player if I could. So are these the skill sets you picked up there? I've, are these things that you can monetize either for yourself or as a consultant for someone else moving forward? Absolutely. I still do it today. So, you know, with tour management, tour management in particular, I mean, you know, being a, an advanced guy for, you know, for two years with Terrence and Robert and then uh, working as the booking agent, I had to advance shows. Uh, I did that for my own band for three years. Um, you know, in Nashville, what's cool about Nashville is you, if you can make yourself into an asset, <clears throat> you can get paid more um, and you can always keep a job. And what I've been able to do is, you know, get on a gig with an artist and, you know, eventually let them know that I do tour management uh, and I can advance the shows. And I've been able to make more money that way. You know, you can, you know, any artist who's smart is going to try to save money in any way they can. And one of the easiest ways is to just use one of their band members who you know who has the skills uh to be their tour manager uh you you pay them more and then you save less on you know one less mouth that you got to get per diem to one less person you got to get a hotel room to you're saving money in the long run by bringing on somebody in the short 
a short run to, to do your to do your tour management. So um, yeah, so I've been I've I, you know um, I've been able to monetize it to to a certain extent, and um, you know it's kind of how my brain works. I like to um, I like to get everything organized in a certain way, and um, and and I just like to I like to help. I like to help people. I like to make sure that they're, they're set and they don't have to worry about certain things. Hmm. Um, that's sort of, I get that from, <clears throat> I get that from my parents. So, cool, so yeah, I've been able to monetize it. So what are you working on now that you're excited about? Um, so a couple things, uh, I just am in the middle of a tour with an artist named Noah Khan. Um, he's a young new artist, uh, signed to Republic records and, uh, I'm playing guitar for him right now. Um, his record's going to drop in January. He's really great. I mean, he's a young guy, killer voice. He's got a lot of potential and, um, just a great kid. I mean, you know, I, when I was tw- 21 years old, I was, you know, I was just a, you know, just an asshole who just like, liked to party. I was still, you know, I still had my shit together to an extent, but it was still like, I couldn't be in the position of being an, an artist, um, uh, like an artist on that level. And he is, he's a 21 year old that has a lot of, uh, a lot of insight, a lot of wisdom. He's smart. He's super easy to get along with. So I really, I really enjoy playing with him. And, and, um, and that's one Country? of the things I'm excited about. Country? No, it's more of like a folk rock thing. It's kind of like, um, I don't know. It's just, it's a really good folk pop type of situation. It's got a lot of different aspects of that genre to it. Um, and then another thing I've been working on that I really, I'm really proud about, um, is an artist, his name is Travers Joffre. He's from New Orleans. Uh, he and I have been friends for a while. We were in different bands when I was living in New Orleans. Um, and when I moved to Nashville, I wanted to get into the production game. And so his, uh, manager is my best friend, told my buddy about it, asked him like, Hey, do you have any projects coming up? I want to start producing. Uh, and he hooked me up with Travers and we did a record for him in Nashville, um, with my guys. And it sounds absolutely incredible. It's called, um, records called highway Kings. It was released in April. Um, and Travers is one of those, he's another one of those guys that it's a rare find for, uh, rare to find someone like him. He is so dedicated to his craft. He's a piano player in the style of Dr. John and James Booker and professor long hair. Um, but and, and he literally travels like we we haul an upright a 500 pound upright piano oh in a my god every single show i mean we've had to battle like we i mean it's it, this guy is a maniac he's he's, <laughs> he's admitted he's admittedly masochistic because he loves loading and unloading this honk of piano uh out of a trailer um, and we do a lot of, we've just, I finished a duo run with him not too long ago. We went up to the uh, East coast, um, and South and, you know, he's going to be, he's going to be something to, to, to look forward to, uh, to, because his music is so eclectic and, um, you know, straddles a lot of different genres. Um, but he's got his own sound. So that record again is highway Kings, uh, all over that record. Great. Um, great record. Just, you know, from a production standpoint, from a playing standpoint, um, you know, it's got a lot of cool stuff. It's not your typical record, you know, it's sort of, um, it's kind of spooky. Um, there's some like pop elements to it and there's some just straight up like playing like blues elements to it that sound awesome. So, um, if you're listening, at least, you know, check it out on Spotify or Google play music or whatever, um, worth, worth the listen. And you play, you co-produced that, and you also played on that. Yeah, co-produced and played on it. Yeah. Would you play guitar? Yeah, I played guitar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, so, Little Rock, growing up, it was good. Yeah, man, it was great. It's great. I mean, you know, it. it I was ready to get the hell out of there. <laughs> but, uh, but I liked it. You know, it was it was nice. I mean, I was like I said, I was lucky to have a really great teacher, and this guy Ben Harris, who was my teacher for. Um, for my formative years. I mean, this guy opened my eyes to stuff. Um, I was lucky enough to be in a family where my mother loved music and my father loved music and she had a great record collection, but Ben really opened my eyes to the deeper sides of music. Um, from a playing standpoint, you know, what to listen for, you know, what's good and what's not good. Um, and you know, that guy's my big brother and, um, he's, you know, he's, if I didn't have him, I wouldn't be here. So, 
you know, I, I, I ex- like, you know, Little Rock was one of those places where I was, a you know, it's small pond. And I was the guy that whenever on the weekends, you go out to party, I would be the kid bringing my acoustic. It's my acoustic electric strat acoustic, uh, fender strat acoustic and my little bitty like rolling cube <laughs> and, uh, plug it up at a party and just jam and with my buddies you know we would do like the dave matthews tim reynolds thing Mm. and i would obviously be tim reynolds and then they would get laid that night and i would just you know keep playing guitar (laughs) 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 you know so uh uh you know i loved it man i mean i was just one of the you know one of those i just loved playing guitar growing up i mean it was i love music and i still do and um and i didn't really get into it till i was a little bit later than most but, uh, it was, you know, 12, 13 years old, but man, that my teacher pushed me to be great and he still does every day. So, you know, we talk all the time. So, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I, I like going back. Um, I'm glad I don't live there now, but I, I, you know, I love, I love that city. It's a beautiful city. Nobody knows about it, which is great because nobody yeah. goes there. Uh, so there's still a lot of beautiful trees and you're not far from the middle of nowhere. And, um, yeah, it's great. It's a great place to call home. You mentioned that your mom and dad both worked hard in their jobs. What they do? What kind of work did they do? Uh, my my mom was a dental hygienist for, uh, and she's just about to leave that. Uh, she actually stopped doing dental hygiene last year, uh, this year actually. Um, but she was a dental hygienist for almost forty years, and my father was a um, a nuclear medical technician, so or technologist. So he was he was the guy. If you have to go to if you get like a stress test done, he's the guy that shoot you with all the radioactive stuff that flows through your body so they can see it for a CAT scan or stress test or something like that. Um, both, both of them are brilliant minds, really smart. You know, um, my father's got the, the mathematics. He's had his, ma- you know, he double majored in physics and mathematics and, um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Holy. After going through all that shit, he, yeah, finished his degree in a few years, finished physics and mathematics, uh, was really into astronomy and astrology or, uh, yeah, really into astronomy and uh and just all forms of engineering and science and stuff like that so uh you know and my mom my mom is sort of the humanities aspect of it you mm-hmm. know she's so it's like my left brain right brain I, yeah. i'm an only child so it's i got the best of both worlds very cool man yeah. so you had a bunch of good teachers how soon you started playing guitar at 12 how soon after you started taking lessons and you know you're like you said you're the kid who always came walked around with his guitar yeah. How, how like at what point in time did you suddenly say, okay, this isn't just like a fun thing. This is my now my mission in life to do this. Well, uh, it's a little it, it, it's layered. So um, I, I wanted to. I realized. Uh, uh, I guess I was a junior senior in high a junior in high school that I wanted to go at least try to go to school for it. Hmm. Um, I had been playing guitar about three four years at that point, and I just started to learn jazz. My teacher started get me into jazz. I was in the jazz band in high school. I got into like all state jazz band a couple years in a row and realized like, this is something I might want to do. Um, I also was like a big debater in high school and was like state debate champion and shit like that. So I, there was also this path of like, you know, sort of maybe go to law school, maybe do politics, maybe try to go work as, you know, in, um, you know, for government or for the UN or something like that. If my father every day was stressing, like, you should be an international lawyer and help people, you know, whatever. Um, and so I went to college, uh, sort of with that in mind. And, uh, it was really in 2008. I mean, I was working, I had worked for my Senator from Arkansas over the summer, Blanche Lincoln at the time. And I was really into politics. I started working for the for Obama's campaign in 2008. I was like the Louisiana, the, the director of the Louisiana Students for Obama campaign, and uh, and like I got an offer from them in uh, the spring to move to Chicago, work for his campaign, and whatever from there. And then I had already booked my uh, booked my you know uh, Netherlands trip to go study abroad there. And, you know, it was sort of this moment of which do I choose? Do I choose the path of least resistance of, uh, of going to DC and making money that way? And like maybe being a part of something great or whatever, or do I go do music? Do I go to the Netherlands, not make, not take a lot of classes, 
practice all the time, get deep into the darkness and just like figure out who I am. And I chose music um, because I wanted, even though it would be harder, I feel like I would have been happier. Um, so, you know, I went over there and um, I was unsure of, you know, who I was musically and if I was even that good, because in New Orleans, they're really tough on you, um, especially not being from there and growing up in that in that that type of scene. Uh, and then I went there and I found there was a, there was a bar that did a jazz jam every week, uh, every Monday. This is in the Netherlands. This is in Nijmegen. Yeah. The Netherlands. And so I went there and, uh, and immediately was these musicians, these great musicians over there were just drawn to me and they said, man, you're so great. You're from America. You live in new Orleans. You sound amazing. And I like figured out, you know, I, I was there, uh, for six months and seven months and, you know, I learned to find myself, uh, and I learned to, um, musically or personally, uh, more so musically, I think, I mean, I, I was pretty, pretty aware of myself at that point, but you know, one comes with the other. I mean, it's, they're, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. I mean, they're connected to you, especially if you're a musician, mm -hmm. you know, you are your music. I mean, you are, I mean, you're, you're emoting yourself from your instrument. It's like when you play a note, if I played a note on guitar and you played a note on guitar, it sound completely different if it was on the same guitar, you know, because you're playing yourself through your instrument. So I learned a lot over there about myself musically in that I, I could do it. If I tried and I put myself to it and I focused on it, I could do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I got back, that's sort of when it took hold, uh, when it was a powerful hold on me. It's like, you know what, you're going to try to do this. You're going to make, make a big attempt to... Um, to be uh, a professional musician. And that's when I did the band. I'd had my own band for a few years. And then, um, and then I moved up here because I really wanted to be a professional, like a legit professional guitar player. Hmm. Musician, so, sounds stuff. like your time in Netherlands gave you both the, the confidence and the uh, motivation. Yeah. I mean, when you're, when you're stuck in a cell block, which was my room because I couldn't really <laughs> decorate it. Cause I was living, cause I was there for only a few months when you're stuck in a cell block and it gets dark at three o'clock in the afternoon and <laughs> eat is legal, you know, and you live next to a liquor store, you know, you can practice a lot and figure, <laughs> <laughs> you know, figure out anything. It's you, like, you know, you can, it's, and, and it's, you know, and I befriended a lot of musicians over there and I went to see a lot of great music in Amsterdam. There's the BIM house. So I went to Amsterdam a lot and saw shows at the BIM house. I went to, uh, how know, far is it? How far? How do you get there from the Netherlands? Uh, it was by train, easy train. You know, the Netherlands has it together, man. The Netherlands is the shit. It, if if I could live, if I could live anywhere and do my job, it would probably be the Netherlands because they just have it. They just have their shit on point, man. It's like if it's like New Orleans. It's like if New Orleans had its infrastructure together, it would look almost exactly like Amsterdam. Um, and, and that's sort of one of the reasons I couldn't live in New Orleans anymore is because just I couldn't deal with the infrastructure. Um, but uh, but yeah, so, you know, I, you figure it out when you're over there. I mean, I just locked myself in my room and I, <clears throat> I had a really shitty acoustic guitar and my 335 and I just practiced all the time. And I practiced different tunings. I learned a bunch of Joni Mitchell tunings and wrote a bunch of songs that like I've long since forgotten and and just like played and learned slide and all. I mean, I just had the time to practice. Mm. Whereas before I was, you know, doing all this shit, you know, extracurricular shit. And it was just, it was great, but it wasn't, I wasn't being a musician. I was just being a, you know, a go-getter mm. and I needed to be a musician for a while. So, you know, I don't know if you got exposed to this or if you were around it, but I listened to a lot of stoner rock and the Netherlands is probably the hub for stoner rock over in Europe. I don't know if you know. I mean, there's tons, literally tons of bands coming out of the Netherlands and out of the Scandinavian countries in general. Yeah. Great I mean, I, stoner I didn't rock get bands. too into it. It was more, you know, I, I was kind of friends with a lot of the jazz guys over there because mm. through the, that, uh, that jam session. Um, and, you know, I, we just, I don't know. I just went, I never really got into the other local scenes um partly because when i was out with them i was listening to jazz otherwise i was just like in my room practicing guitar yeah. learning you know sunny lander flicks or something like that so um so yeah i mean i i, I would that's one of the reasons i want to go back there is so i can get back into those kinds of scenes you know uh i want to learn about all that kind of music that i really haven't had the time to 
I mean, not necessarily the time, but just I haven't done it. Yeah, yeah. When I say stoner rock, it's like psychedelic rock. But yeah, it's, right, it's, nowadays right. they call it stoner rock. You know, it's no different than, you know, Iron Butterfly in the 60s and right, stuff okay, like that. You know? right. For sure. Um, when you first started playing professionally and you became a professional, what were some of the bigger surprises or the, oh, wow, things you learned like that uh, as from the about the business end that you kind of like – weren't weren't aware uh, of stuff they didn't teach you in school you're easily replaceable it, you and it's so much more about how cool you are and your personality than it is how well you can play um there are so many guys in this town especially um it, and you we can just you know take an example from your podcast how many national guys that you've interviewed who are cool and are good and you know you multiply that times you know, a hundred thousand. And yeah. it's like, there are guys waiting in the wings to take your spot, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I focus so much on being good, learn, you know, getting all my Brad Paisley licks together, moving up to Nashville, getting all my Buck Owens and, you know, Merle Haggard songs learned. And, and, you know, you get up here and, you know, you try to be Danny Gatton and it's like, wait, you know, number one, you need to be yourself. And you need to be cool because I've been on tours with guys and I've, I've some, you know, early tours, I might've been the guy who great player, but just, it's just not fun to hang out with, hmm. you know, who just doesn't like, if, if you're not fun to hang out with on the road. And this is what I tell, I, I, I go back to Loyola and I talk to students sometimes and I tell them like, you know, you play on the stage for at most two hours a night. And if you're, if you're, you know, if you're unlucky enough to play the tin roof circuit four hours a night, the rest of that day, the rest of those 24 hours, the rest of those 20 hours or 22 hours or 23 hours are spent with people. Right. In the, so the, the gig is not, the show is not the gig. The gig is being around people and being right. easy to tour with, easy to get along with. And if you're not, you're going to get replaced. You know, they might not technically be as good as you. But that doesn't matter to them because if they can nail the parts and get, you know, and, and be uh, an individual on stage, then, you know, if, if the artist is happier with them, then they're going to you're, you're not going to have a gig. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was that was a lot of it. And, and another thing, too, is, <clears throat> you know, um, and this is one of the things you were talking about being like an intellectual with jazz or whatever. It's like, you know, um, it, this, the more simple, the better, you know, you're. You know, it like I, I learned that I had to I, I learned that by moving up to Nashville and just diving deep into what I actually love, which is, you know, music that came out of Memphis um, with Stax and, you know, B.B. King and uh, a lot of the other like Chicago blues artists and uh, some of the Texas guys. You know, the real simple stuff is what's going to it's what's going to win out over in the end, um, musically. And that's what more people can relate to. And that's what more musicians can relate to. Honestly. I mean, there are the guys that can really play their butts off and, uh, and like really like, you know, win a crowd over with their, with their complexity. And, but I'm not that way. So mm. what I learned is like, I'm not that guy. So I should stop trying to be that guy. I'm going to try to win people over more with one note than I am with, 30, you know, I, I can't, I've, I've all, even though I've always wanted to be like the guy who can rip, you know, the, you know, the Eric Johnson solo or the, um, or, you know, the Eddie Van Halen solo, like I, you know, i grew up listening to BB King and Leo Nocentelli and Steve Cropper. I mean, right. those guys, they hit one note and you're like, whoa, shit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's that's what it's about for me. So that's what I learned, you know, being in the industry, being a professional, being on sessions, um, being on like bigger sessions, working with bigger artists. You know, they want sometimes if you 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 should learn how to do the complicated stuff and get your few licks in there. But really, it's all about like the one note, the one chord, learning how to manipulate your effects, learning how to manipulate a whammy bar. Like all of those technical things that are real subtle in the, you know, that, that seem really subtle. Those are the things you need to focus on. Um, or at least that's for me, that's just for me. I'm not going to try to tell anybody else, but 
that's for me. The one thing I will tell other people is you got to be cool in this business. If you're not cool, if you're douchey or if you're just trying to get it in there for yourself or if you're just, you know, focusing on like, you know, just going out there and getting chicks or going out there and impressing people, then you should be your own artist. It's going to be hard for you to get a gig being at someone else's player. Sure. Uh, if you're if you're doing that kind of thing. It's all about the hang. That's what it All says. about the hang, dude. I want to get that tattooed, but I can't get tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that first expensive guitar you got when you were a kid, was that the 335 you have? Yeah, so... That is... Uh, wow, that's a great first guitar, man. Holy I, smokes. Man, trust me, dude. I, I'm, I'm not complaining about my life at all, dude. I've had... I've lived a great life. So, you know, my, we were not wealthy at all. I mean, we were middle class to lower middle class um, for the majority of my life. And uh, my grandfather, he always, for some reason, this guy always had like five or six cars. He was one of those grandpas. Like he's from the country. I mean, he's from Caddo, Arkansas, came from absolute nothing and was a state auditor. And he made some money in his life. And he was like, you know, um, I'm going to just, I'm going to have like, I'm going to have my Lincoln. I'm going to have my truck and I'm going to have an SUV. And he eventually, you know, he had this, and he, he had a few other cars in the lot too, but um, had his camper. And so he told my parents that he was just going to give me one of his cars when I turned 16. So my parents said, you know, okay, we, we're not going to get him a car. We need to get him something that he will have for the rest of his life, something more valuable than a car. So they talked to my teacher, uh, Ben Harris, the guy I was talking about earlier, and they asked him, you know, should we get him a, they were going to get me a Gibson and they said, do we, do we get him a 335 or do we get him a Les Paul? And wow. Ben said, you got to get a 335. And, uh, because that was, I had just started really focusing a lot on guitar. That was sort of one of my major, major passions. And I was in the jazz bands and, uh, and I had this telly, which was great, but it wasn't really a thing. And Ben said, you got to give him a 335. And they lucked out and they got me like one of the best 335s I've ever played. And I mean, I've played a, a bunch of them and they just got me this amazing guitar. And it was, uh, yeah, man, I mean, I'm just lucky to have parents who cared, who supported that, you know, because yeah. there are a lot of parents out there who don't. So, and okay. So talk about you right now, you're playing a 335 and then yeah. you also have a Rocco Rattlecaster. Yeah. So it's one of those things like, building relationships is what this industry is about. I mean, you have, um, I, I met a guy in Nam named Tim Rocco who builds amazing guitars in Nashville. And, um, he's been my, you know, go-to guy for four years, five years. And we've worked on some builds together and a lot of them actually. And yeah, so it's this basically a telly. Um, and this telly, um, I know we're on, on audio, but I'll show it to you. It's yeah, like man. a, uh, it's a, it's like a, it's a, it's like a national telly. It's got a five way switch and, uh, you know, it's basically a, you know, a black guard with a maple neck and it's five way switch. And I, so, you know, I got this. Okay. So uh, let me just describe it for It's a butterscotch yeah. telly with a maple neck, three pickups. Uh, one of them's a lipstick, um, the, the neck pickup and uh, no, it's, so, that's just, it's telly, telly, and then a strap pickup in the middle. Okay. There you go. So it's two telly pickups in the bridge and the neck and then a strap pickup in the middle. And it's a five way switch black yeah. pick guard. Nice looking guitar. Yeah. And it plays great. And he just, he hand makes them and, um, and it's, you know, it's hard to find a guitar. It's hard to find a ma a builder who, or a luthier who really can, can execute your vision uh, and understands what you like. Hmm. And I've worked with this guy for long enough to, to know that it, he knows exactly what I like and what I want. And so we've worked on a lot of stuff together. Uh, and so now I have, God, I've got so many of his guitars. I've got, um, you know, he, he built me a Les Paul, you know, cause they're so expensive. He didn't want me to buy one. So he built me this, he built me a gold top. Wow. Uh, it doesn't this look exactly like a Les Paul too. Yeah. It looks like a gold, looks like a gold top Les Paul, man. Yeah, it's a gold top Les Paul. And then I told him I wanted, you know, it really what, what goes down is I'm like, hey, man, I'm thinking about like these kind of uh, like look, getting one of these guitars. And he's like, well, hold on a second. Let me just figure it out. And I'll build it for you. And I wanted to get an electric resonator. And he built me this an electric res resonator. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so he's just one of those guys. He's just like down for whatever. And the best part about it is like it's not expensive. He hand makes, hand builds, hand winds everything. These oh, the pickups. Are, he winds the pickups. 
Lines all the pickups. Wow, that's a, he, he's a masochist. Yeah, uh, it, absolutely. It ab, absolutely. Holy he, crap! He doesn't wear a mask when he's spraying nitro. I mean, this dude is hard fucking core. There's a video on my on my on my Instagram uh, and a, and the string joy string Instagram. I guess they used it where we uh, one of the guitars that I'm using we lit it on fire. I saw that. <laughs> and uh, and and like he's like he he messaged me and he was like, hey man, you want to light you want to burn the edges on this guitar? I'll get a blowtorch. And I was like, fuck yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> so I mean, we just do fun shit like that. I mean, he's so fun to, to work for to work with and and uh, I feel like I, and I tell him I'm like, yo man, like. These are your guitars too. I mean, they're. I mean, they're. I, they're mine because I play them and they live with me. But they're your guitars too. So, um, he's a great guy, man. And uh, so, Rocco Guitars definitely want to promote that guy. Um, Rocco RoccoGuitars.com. Go check his stuff out. It's it's incredibly inexpensive. He used to be a player. You know, his most expensive guitar. Uh, you know, it might be that Les Paul, but um, none of his guitars are like his rattle. His Strats and Tellys are all custom built and they're under. They're like fifteen hundred bucks. Um, wow, that's the same price you're going to pay for an off the rack telly or a yeah, that's telly. yeah, machine built and like maybe not the best woods and like you don't get to choose anything. This is a hundred percent custom. You know, he's got what he likes, but you tell him what you want and he'll build it for you for fifteen hundred, fifteen fifty. I mean, it's it's incredible, man. I mean, and he's got guitars that he sells that are, that have been in his shop for a long time that he sells for under a thousand dollars, dude, and it's. It's sad to me, but it's also like, you know, this guy just wants players to play his guitars. He yeah. was a player in the 70s, great guitar player in L.A., moved to Nashville, and he just wants guys to play his shit, and he doesn't care. I mean, he just he just loves seeing guys play a guitar that they like, and if, if they don't like it, he'll fix it. You know what I mean? It, it's it's incredible, dude. So Very cool, man. Very yeah. cool. So shout out to Rocco Guitars. Shout out. Um, what you, what, Let's talk about this is the therapy part of the uh, <laughs> of the interview. Everybody sometimes people say that they say, "Hey, Craig, I feel like this is therapy." And my first response is, "I am very ill qualified to be right. a- anyone's therapist." So that's like really scary. But um, so you're, I'm, I'm assuming you're outgoing by nature. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you, so like, because a lot of guys are shy and they like have to become out. Like this is a like an alternative personality for them, but you're not. Right. You know, yeah. I've always been outgoing. Both of my parents are really outgoing. Um, you know, I like to be, uh, I like to be shy sometimes or not necessarily shy, but I like to be a hermit sometimes, especially when you get off the road. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming. And, and, and the older I get, the more, the less I really want to go out and when I'm in town, uh, unless I'm hanging with my friends, yeah. you know, people I haven't seen in a while, my close friends. I, I hear no, that man, a I'm, lot. I'm I'm I, I'm down to talk to pretty much anybody at any time about anything for the most part. Um, you know, I'll get into d- broad discussions about anything with anybody, uh, and you know, listen to them. And yeah, I mean, it's I don't know. It's just, people people can be great. Is they can be as shitty as they can be great. So you yep. know, being outgoing, I've just met a lot of. I mean, I feel like that's how I've gotten to where I am. You know, it's like I haven't, yeah, totally. I haven't, I, I, I've done a lot of cool things. I haven't accomplished a whole, whole lot, but man, I've met some amazing people for being outgoing. I mean, I met fucking Herbie Hancock from being outgoing. I've met Lenny Kravitz twice from being outgoing. You know what I'm saying? Like, wait a minute. So far. Yeah. Right. So far. Right. Right. <laughs> up to this point. <laughs> and, and, and so it's just like, you know, you, 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 and it's a lot about risk taking. I mean, if you're outgoing, you're probably more likely to take a risk. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. And yeah, so for sure, outgoing. And you can always pull out your inner debate team if you need to. Right. Oh, I trust <laughs> me. My wife would say I do that every day. Hey, uh, this is probably an interesting question. I'd like to hear your answer. If you weren't doing what you're doing now, what do you think you'd be doing instead? Well, if it was a dream, if I was pursuing a dream, man, this uh, is all we have here on Everyone Loves Guitar. Right, it's butterscotch, dream. roses, and dreams, yeah, man. Sunshine dream. and roses and dreams. Yeah, oh, I love butterscotch. Maybe I would make butterscotch. No, um, I would. You know, if it was my dream, I would try my hardest and put all I could into being uh, a uh, a pitcher for the Atlanta Braves. Wow, uh, that's huge interesting. Baseball fan, huge baseball fan. That's interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, no, but realistically speaking, 
I would probably be either uh, working for some like education nonprofit or uh, working in DC as some like political thing. Yeah, that's what I, I thought. I, I thought you were going to say that some yeah, sort of political involvement. Some, like you know, hopefully working for uh, one of the good guys. You know, trying to save babies from you know from war or something like that i don't know mm. <laughs> working for like the child defense fund or or you know i don't know refugee you're helping refugees out or sure. uh maybe trying to broker peace in the middle east or something like that i don't know that's 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 the pipe dream you'd be employed for a long but, time <laughs> but, but, yeah, exactly or, or yeah. i would just be some hack fucking lobbyist trying to you know make all the money i could and then uh, you know, uh, although there are a lot of lobbyists that are good people cause I know some of them. So hopefully I'd be one of the good guys, but I don't know. I really don't know. It's one of those things like you get to a certain point in your life and you're like, you know, like what, why would I, what, like, what was I thinking doing this? And it's like, and then you, you know, you think about it for a while and you're like, yeah, it's probably better that I did this anyway. It's like, I'd probably either be dead or, uh, you know, like on major high blood pressure medication if I didn't do this. <laughs> Hey man, so I know your dad passed last year, and uh, I'm really sorry yeah. for your loss. But oh, I was thanks. curious, uh, what was the most important thing that he taught you? Uh, to be passionate, um, to always be passionate about what you do and what you believe, and um, you know, he. I mean, you talk about passion. I mean, this guy was. I mean, and it's one of those things too. Like. It, I always think about him and his life and my mom too, because they both came from, I mean, my, my mom came from super humble beginnings in Arkansas and they went through, I mean, just, they saw an area of the country, an era of our country that was way more volatile. I mean, you know, when my mom was born, you know, segregation was still, and Jim Crow were still, you know, super in the zeitgeist. I mean, they were there, they, you different see you're using an sat word man yeah right okay, zeitgeist yeah. well there were, well i know zeitgeist because there was an art there was an art uh studio in in new orleans that did shows called the zeitgeist so I mean, <laughs> no excuses I, yeah no excuses right uh but you know they, it was it was like they um they experienced so much shit and they came out on the other side i mean my mom got fired from her job when she was in because she wouldn't wear a bra to work one day and my father wow moved. you know how times have changed now they'd be like man she's a great employee she never wears right. a bra <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. she, she's she, awesome she get fired for another reason right yeah. <laughs> um, but uh my father moved to america and ha- didn't know any english first thing he did was try to go get a job he got a job as uh he literally got a job as a waiter in a high-end seafood restaurant in galveston texas taking people's orders and he was great at it. He had no English though. He would he would ask people to show him the menu, and he would learn his partially learn his English by writing down the things and ask them what it was called. I mean, if you went to a restaurant now and some Iranian dude was your waiter and doing that to you, you would be like, "Who the fuck are you? Like, can I get a waiter that speaks English, please?" But for some reason, my dad just did it, and he did great at it, and he made money and. He was 22 years old, didn't know anything, didn't know anybody. He was the first one to come here out of his friend group. He got he got more of his friends to come over, and then he just, like, did it. And it's sort of one of those things, like, I don't have an excuse. Like, my excuses are super limited, or just, like, there's no excuse for me not being successful because of what both of them did. Sure. But my father was just so passionate about, about helping people and about, you know, people being taken care of um, – and, and, you know, like the, and, and he was, you know, and, and politically speaking, he was incredibly far left. So he was one of those guys that only wanted, like, he just wanted people to have their lives helped by everybody else. So, you know, he would give you the last $2 that he ever had to his name if it helped you get something to eat or if it helped you be happy. He was one of those guys. So, and he was very, 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 very passionate about it. So I learned passion from him more than anything else for sure. Awesome. What's your, uh, what's your non-musical superpower? Ooh, I'm really good at the claw game. Uh, the what? The claw game, you know, what is it, that? It, 
you know. Oh, the, oh, at the the arcade. Yep. Stuffed animals. And yeah, stuff like that, that that is pretty cool, man. That, I, that know, is a super. That I, is a literal superpower because I don't know anybody there, who's good at that. There's a restaurant called R and O's, R and O's in New Orleans, a uh, really great seafood restaurant, and I always go there with my uh, wife and in laws when we're in New Orleans. And the first time I went there with them, I they have a claw machine, and I got two, I got two at once, like wow claw. And so ever since then, whenever we go, my father-in-law <clears throat> will, after we're done eating, he will give, he will keep, and this guy is the most frugal man you will ever meet in your entire life. He does what he, if he didn't have to spend money on anything, he wouldn't, he <laughs> will get, he will just keep handing me dollar bills until I win something. I mean, he loves it. So I, and I always win two at one time. So it's just like. You know, I, I don't know. For some reason, I'm good at that. Uh, that is I, uh, a superpower. Think, though, my wife thinks I should be on uh, Wheel of Fortune too. I don't know if that's a superpower, but I'm pretty good at this. At Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> there you go. Um, any hobbies or interests outside of music? Um, I'm trying to think of. I, I don't know. I love. I don't know. I just love hanging out with my friends. I just love helping people. So like, I'm, you know, I'm the guy that you call when like you're, you know, my buddy was building a shed the other day and I'm like, yo, let me just come help you dig the holes and lay the concrete foundation. And, uh, that's sort of what I like. I just like hanging out with my friend, you know, hanging out with friends and family, drinking, uh, eating food, you know, like you were saying before. Yeah, man, you're a good foodie. Yeah, you that, could tell your passion for hobby. Me. Yeah. I mean, I love, you know, trying out different kinds of, you know, wine and coffee and beer and trying if, different kinds of traveling maybe. I don't know. Hey, if anybody's moving, make him a good meal and invite him over. <laughs> it's really great when you can, when your job, when your career is a hobby, yeah, for other people, yeah. You know, so it's hard for. I mean, I haven't really, you know, I've focused so much on doing this that it's like it's also my hobby because when I'm not pra- when I'm not working, I'm practicing learning guitar. So my hobby is also kind of music, you know. Mm. It's weird, but yeah, that's sort of. Uh, three more questions, man, and I'm going to let you go. I appreciate your time. Uh, anything you're currently trying to improve on, whether it's musically, personal, business, or anything else? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, I'm always trying. I mean, I'm always trying to improve my, my technique, and I'm always trying to improve um, my ability to just not – or just to be more open-minded musically. Um, Interesting. Uh, and, you know, from a business standpoint, you know, really trying to, you know, they, I mean, I'm not a big fan of social media. I don't, I don't really like it that much. I think it doesn't really do that much of good for, you know, um, for the, for humanity at the same time though, as a, as an individual who's my own business, I have to get better at that. So that's one thing I try to get better at. Mm. Um, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm always just trying to improve and I'm always just trying to be more open-minded person in general. I mean, it, it, it your life's going to be a lot easier for more open-minded, uh, less stressful. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, for sure. Um, toughest decision you ever had to make or the hardest thing you ever had to do. Mm. Um, I don't, I'm trying to think, uh, just maybe decide where I was going to go to school in between the, like during hurricane Katrina. Yeah, that was probably tough, man. Um, I could have literally gone anywhere in the country. I mean, I could have gone to Harvard or Berkeley college of music. Um, and I could have stayed in little rock and it was such a hard decision to make. Cause I was just, I was like, Holy shit. What the fuck just happened? Like where's <laughs> my life is just like, gone upside down and I was one of the lucky ones too but yeah that was probably the hardest decision but I'm you know in St. Louis I didn't really enjoy it except for that one silver lining um so but yeah that was probably the hardest one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make and the last question man and this is situational because I think this definition changes what's your definition of happiness Alex man uh uh yeah I don't know uh it's it's multi-layered but you know being around people you love 
doing the thing that you love is my definition of is sort of a definition that I try to force myself to have because people, you know, being set financially, being, you know, on a better foot financially can be, can lead to happiness. It's not happiness itself, but true happiness. I think, I mean, you know, I was in, um, Turkey a couple years ago, meeting my father's side of the family for the first time. And, uh, and just being with them and my soon to be wife and my mom and my dad, just everybody around together laughing and learning from each other and, you know, all that. I mean, that's sort of happiness for me, being around people that you love hmm. doing what you love. I mean, that's, you know, because, you know, life's kind of too short to just always be focusing on, you know, killing it financially and, um, having good friends and, and having a support system is going to get you, is going to get you set financially. Um, but having, you know, but having a good financial setup isn't going to get you a good family. Isn't going to get you good friends. It's not going to, so, you know, good, my wife and I always say good people beget good people. So when you, I, when I surround myself with those kinds with people that I love and trust and respect, and that makes me happy and it makes me more comfort, comforted to know that, you know, the success is going to come eventually. Yeah. It's ironic. We are all so, uh, goal focused, but yet yeah. the goals are not the things that make us happy. It's the non it's, you know, and you kind of, when you think that through, you think about, man, and my goals, you know, do I need to reevaluate, you know, but at the same time, you know, like, you know, I love hanging out with my wife. Well, I, I, if I spent 24 hours a day with Anne and never did anything, that would not be good either. That would not yeah. be con conducive to spending more time with her and doing right. that. Yeah. Right. So it's a, yeah, go you ahead. know, I think it's a tough thing to balance. It is. Um, it, it is a tough thing to balance. It's sort of, you know, me being on the road all the time. Um, and, uh, my wife also travels. So it's, it's one of those things that, you know, when you're away, you know, it's one of those, I mean, the, the cliche distance makes the heart distance makes the heart grow fonder. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it's true. I mean, when I'm away from my good friends, when I'm away from my wife, when I'm away from my, my mom or any family members, you know, it makes me want to be with them more. And, uh, it, gr and when I'm with them, it grounds, it grounds you because, mm -hmm being an artist, being someone that's on stage and after stage you go off and people are just doing nothing, but, Oh, you sounded so great. Blah, blah, blah. You're this sort of like minor, minute celebrity to these people. Yeah. You know, when you go home and you're with your family and friends and they're just giving you shit and you know, you're, you're taking out the trash and picking up the dog like, shit. I, yeah. Me, yeah. It's like, oh, okay, cool. Like this is what it is. Cause people who know me, you know, I like to talk to people and, and but it's I, I just enjoy like, you know, I just enjoy messing with people and having a good time and being, you know, the the, the joker. You know, it's not like about um, it's ne it's never been about the fame or the, you know, the like, oh, look at look at that guy. Look at look at Alex Bichar. I don't I, I don't know. That kind of weirds me out. I've never wanted to be like the number one guy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I just like to. I like to, you know, just be around my friends, be around my family, take shit from everybody and then dish it out. And then, you know, over a over a fire and a bottle of wine or a nice beer or, you know, some good old Budweiser and some, you know, some fried chicken or something, you know, or some hash in Amsterdam. Yeah, or, or a fat blunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, just kidding. But yeah, it's one of those things. You know, it's it's all about just being. You know, and and it's you have to, and and like like I said before, man. I'm just you know a lot of people, and I, I tell myself this every day. And this is part of the happiness question. There are a lot of people in this world who don't have anything. There are a lot of people in this world in this country, in our, in my neighborhood, in my friend circle who don't have the support, the family, the, like the really good friends, just, just the, the kind of system, the support system and family that I have. And I'm just beyond lucky and grateful to have 
who I have in my life, man, you know, good and bad. It's just, you know, I can't, if you dwell on all the bad stuff, you're going to, you're, you're not going to see all the great stuff that's around you. And I try every day to just be thankful for that because it's, um, you know, you're, you're only given one shot as yourself. And, uh, you know, if I'm lucky enough to have a setup where I can call people and ask them questions and, and call old teachers and, and get advice from them and call friends and, and talk about like what's making me happy or sad, then, you know, I know I'm having a good day because there are people all around this world who are living in just not in not that situation, whether whether it's, you know, just a little bit different or they're living in like a war zone and they've lost everybody and they're just by themselves and they don't know what to do. Like I, there's there's too much suffering in this world for me to be complaining about how shitty my life is. You know, I live in Nashville. I've got a home. I got these awesome guitars. I'm being interviewed on a cool podcast. There, there's, there, there's so much. There's so don't much, get carried away now. <laughs> yeah, right. There's so much. There's so much good in my life. You know that the bad is sort of. You know, it weighs. It. it I, I can't. I can't let that overweigh over compensate. Um, especially, and, and it's hard to do when there's not a lot of work going on, and there's hard to do. It's hard to do when um, you. You know, I, and in my career there have been a lot of build up and let there's been a lot of build up and let down, build up and let down, build up and let down. My wife equates it to like being an, an, an actor, you know, it's sort of, you get to a point and it's about to hit and then nothing happens. And then you just kind of lose that opportunity one way or another. And, you know, you go into super dark places, um, a lot. And if you're able to just kind of, you know, for me, like reset, you know, your mind, I can, I have to reset my mind that day and just say, look, you know, yeah, it's bad right now, but here's what you have that other people don't. Here's, you know, these people who are working a lot, they might have the work, but they might not have the, what I have. Sure. You know, I have to, I have to look at it from that situation that, that happiness isn't working all the time. Happiness is, happiness is a, is a function of, or it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the ends to having a good family and a good support system and, and, and a good life, you know, all together. So, so yeah, I mean, a long, long winded answer, but I, I just think that's super important, if, especially for guys in the industry, for guitar players or musicians or whoever listening to this, that, that like, they feel that it's, it's, you know, it's weighing too much on them to do it. You know, i I'm there all the time. I mean, you know, before I got this tour that I'm on or the tour before, you know, this summer there wasn't a lot of work for me and I went through just a, you know, just like a, every time there's no work, I go through this situation of like, what the fuck am I doing with my life? Where, where's the, you know, the next paycheck going to come from? But you know, it's like, I look at it and I'm, I would rather have, if I had the choice to either have A or B, I would rather have what I have now with the, the lows of being <laughs> dipping than the lows of not having anybody around me to help me or support me or, uh, you know, support me, meaning not necessarily, not financially. Oh, I know. Emotionally. Yeah. I totally get that. And, and, and just from a friend standpoint, you know, that's, that's the more important thing for me. Um, and, and whoever's listening to this, if they're going through that, just know that, you know, there are people who in your life, whether you know it or not, who are there for you. And if they're not, then, you know, you can hit me up and I'll be there for you. <laughs> there you go. Just make them a meal. That's it. Yeah, just yeah, just come over and hang, and I'll make you a meal. I'll get you a beer. It's there all good. you go, man. Hey, man, I uh, can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, is there anything you'd like to promote, or anything that you know? How can people find out about what you're doing? Yeah, so um, you know, uh, Instagram is a way to follow me. It's really only one thing I do, not even semi regularly, but uh, it's at ak bach a k b a c h. Um, you know, for guitar players out there who are listening to this, go check out Rocco Guitars. Um, they're really great. Uh, I also work with source audio pedals. Um, they're really, really great pedal company that do, they're doing some really great stuff. RoccoGuitars.com, sourceaudio.net. Um, check out Travers Joffre, um, on any, where you listen to music, uh, check out Noah Khan, K-A-H-A-N, Noah Khan, anywhere you listen to music. Um, you know, I work with a lot of different artists in town in Nashville. So if you're ever in Nashville and you want to hit me up, please do. 
uh, if I'm in town, you know, trying to make a hang, not, you know, whatever. Uh, and yeah, man. So, you know, those are ways to find, I mean, I got a website really just for my, uh, you know, really just so my mom can follow my, uh, my schedule. <laughs> there you go. And that's at so, alexpachari.com. Yeah. Alexpachari.com. Yeah. Hopefully be, eventually there'll be a, uh, a more, uh, a better website up there, but you know, for now it's just my tour dates. So, and if you want to check it out, it's Alex, A L E X Pachari, B A C H A R I.com. All right, man. Uh, you're an awesome guy. You're a freaking very positive, uh, ball of energy there, man. I'm, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much <laughs> Thanks, for coming man. on the show. It, you gotta be in this industry, man. That's shit. It's fucking hard. Well, you know what? Any entrepreneurial, you know what? I, I've come to learn. I'm coming out of the business world, and, and I still am very much in the business world. And um, being a professional musician is like running any entrepreneurial, being any entrepreneur. You know, you have highs and lows, and, and it helps to have a couple of plan B, C, D, and E. And But sometimes plan B, C, D, and E aren't there, man. But, you know, so I, I, I get everything you're talking about, man. Cool. So, hey, listen, everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks again, Alex. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks to Alex Pachari for spending time with us. Check him out online. And go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes. And now be nice. Go play your guitar and have some fun. Till next time, peace and love, and I am out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. 